Rock well, well oh. <laughs> welcome everyone. I'm assuming you're out there. So thanks for having me. I'm Lauren Sinclair and I'm a teacher in Portland, Oregon. And I teach middle school. I've taught pretty much every subject in middle school, but right now I'm focusing on math, science, technology. And as a technology teacher, I am a GIS teacher, geospatial information systems, mostly using ArcGIS online. So I'm very passionate about what you have all been learning today. Um, shout out to my teachers out there. Um, I am here to talk to you about what you can do as a teacher, as a parent, during remote teaching, as a club leader, um, any contact that you have with kids, the resources I'm about to show you today are the easiest, the most fun, and really build a great understanding of how GIS works and how it makes us better able to understand the world around us. So I'm going to show you a couple of resources and then um, open us up for some Q&A at the end. I will also be sharing this whole slideshow with you because it has a lot of links in it to all the things I'm talking about. So don't panic if you're like, wait, I didn't quite catch that website. It will all be here for you at the end. All right, so let's see if I can uh, make this thing work. There it goes. Okay, the reason I am so passionate about making sure that kids get to experience GIS is that they are already visual thinkers. That's just the way they communicate. This is like the meme generation, right? And that's where the, the language of cartography starts. Here's what I mean. These are kids who, this shocked me the year I figured this out. I've been teaching for 14 years. And when I got to the point where I realized all of my students had only ever interacted with touch screens, they just, they poke things and try to get them started. That's the generation we're dealing with here. They communicate in visual ways, like through memes and emojis. I mean, this is a typical conversation with me and my nephew, who is now a freshman, where we're basically just exchanging GIFs, memes, and bitmojis, and that is an entire conversation. So if that's true, to me, that's a strength, because that's really what maps are. They are a visual means of communication. So let's build on that foundation. It works really well. Um, hang on, I'm gonna click a little more button, a little chat button, make sure I'm not missing anything important here. Okay, wonderful, great. Um, the more kids and teens communicate visually, the more they're bringing that with them into their careers later on when they enter the workforce. They're thinking about visual ways of communicating before they think about reading or writing something. I see that in my teaching work, and we're going to see that in the next couple of generations as they become the creatives out there and the executives and the people making decisions and communicating decisions. So when I introduce cartography to kids, I start with that kind of visual communication and the fun part of that and connect the two. Um, the first thing, i click back here real quick. Do, do, do. Okay, okay, okay. The first thing that I would like to highlight for y'all is that that means that we all need to get involved because it's within our reach. And if we're preparing this next generation to be, okay, they're going to be visual communicators, but we want them to also think spatially and help solve the world's biggest problems we can all get on board with helping with this. So my hope for you today is that by seeing these different resources and how easy they are to use, you find one way that you can use one with some kids in your life. A niece, a nephew, maybe you offer something to a teacher who is exhausted in remote teaching and needs someone to come in and just teach one thing for her so she can chill for a minute. Um, there are so many opportunities, maybe a club that your kiddo is part of. So let me show you these resources. These are great. How to get started. The GIS space for K-12, thankfully, thanks to a lot of people you've heard from today, has exploded over the past five years in particular, while I've been paying attention anyway. Um, these resources are easy to use and they're fun. And we're gonna start by looking at geo inquiries. These are my favorite. So when I talk to other teachers at my school, since I'm a technology teacher, I also support other teachers at my school and I say, hey, if you are a social studies teacher, what are you teaching right now? 
then I go do some research and I find a geo inquiry that is an online mapping activity for that teacher. I have had tons of teachers at my school be willing just through our friendship to try one of these activities by letting me come into their classroom and run a geo inquiry while they watch. And their comments are always like, oh, that wasn't hard. I didn't have to learn a new technology. I just had to help the kids learn to read directions carefully, which is always a struggle. And then they were able to figure it out themselves. And it was better than the old pictures of maps I've given them or the uh, paper map that's on the wall. This was a better experience. So let me show you what I mean by this. Geo inquiries, if you click this link here, because you're going to get the slideshow, so you can look at this later. Um, Charlie, tell me in the chat if you can see the new screen. Tell we me got the story map. OK, perfect. Thank you. Geo inquiries are basically a PDF so that they're really easy for you to see that are designed like this. They have a topic that's actually connected to standards if you are a teacher listening or if you want to try to help a teacher in your life connect to something they're already doing. And they move through a couple of different steps to help students investigate a problem or a situation and find answers on their own instead of you just explaining to them. So through each of these, you have directions like click the map URL link above to open the map. Okay, I'm going to click this map URL right here. And then they ask questions. The answers are provided so that you as a teacher or as a parent volunteer can just provide those answers or, or um, once the kids have raised their hands or typed what they think it is in the chat, you can be sure that you're pointing them in the right direction. And then the kids just continue through this series of directions to find and discover all these answers for themselves. Let me show you an example of how this works. So here is the map URL here. I am going to open a geo inquiry that I have done before. Geo, and forgive me because I have very slow internet today. Inquiry. And I want, oh no, I already did save this link for myself. Excuse me. Back here. If you click right here on the connections to every subject later, I put a link for you on the list of all geo inquiries that are possible for or available for you for all subjects. So the great thing about this is it can connect to what your kids are already doing. I have an environmental class, environmental science class. We also have a, like a green team that does like nature studies and projects um, for green initiatives at our school. So I'm going to choose one of these geo inquiries here. I want to know more about marine debris. Kids are really fascinated by this. They want to save the sea turtles. We got to save the sea turtles. So here in the marine debris geo inquiry, I have the map URL, which is always the starting point. So I'm going to click here. It's going to open up the map for the geo inquiry. This is a GIS that is already loaded with all the layers of information and pop ups and pictures and links that you need. So you don't have to do any preparation. You're done. Here I see a GIS that has all sorts of interesting stuff on it, but I don't know a lot of information yet. It just says cold and warm. So I might start this geo inquiry by asking students, what do you notice? What do you think this is going to be about? Then I go back to the directions, which sometimes, where am I at? I'm, nope, yes, marine debris. Sometimes um, I'll put these up on the screen and just cover up the answers. Sometimes I'll make a photocopy of this and white out the answers. I'll show you another trick to make it into their Google Forms that are, sorry, Google Docs that already exist with this. Sometimes I make it into Google Forms. So the first question, it says, click the map URL. I did that. Zoom and pan the map to see all the ocean currents. Why are some of the currents marked red and some marked blue? Well, I can see that already. And now it says, turn on the layer prevailing winds. So let's go back here. You navigate to content and you look for those words, prevailing winds. Let's turn it on. Hmm, I see more arrows now. So I might zoom in, 
I might zoom out and now I can answer the question about prevailing winds and take a guess as a student at what the connection is between these two layers. This is a very quick glimpse into what a geo inquiry is. And what I love about these is that the teachers who have tried them once with my help, with me being in the classroom, now are people who have come back year after year and said, hey, it's that time of year, I'm doing the Silk Road geo inquiry again. And would you just look at it with me and make sure I remember what to do? Okay, great, I'm good. And now they're doing it themselves. It's that easy. There was no need to sign in, no need to create an account for the kids, nothing to manage. Pretty cool. So the last thing I'll show you about geo inquiries is in this lovely little starting point where it says getting to know geo inquiries. This is a story map that explains everything about them so you can get some more detail after this presentation. At the very bottom, there's this get started section. Check this out. Number five, consider if you prefer to use student worksheets. Teachers, if you're out there, this is the part you want to hear. Click Use Student Worksheets. Look at what this is. All of these beautiful PDFs have already been converted into Google Docs for you so that you can just have kids fill in the links. So I'm going to take you to one of my favorites, which is the Silk Road that I mentioned. A lot of my sixth grade teacher friends are teaching the Silk Road right now. And I just went into the wrong folder. World Geography, I need to go into World History. Hello, World History, Silk Roads then and now. Same thing that I just showed you without the pretty colors, but now I can have my students make a copy of this, put their name on it and fill out the questions. So same instructions, they click on the map, they put their name here, here's what I do, I click the link, I click the lines, I answer a question right here. I have also in the past have had teachers say, hey, to save me grading time, would you turn this into a Google form? Easy, I just copy and paste it right over. Done it a million times. So, geo inquiries are my favorite tool as like a gateway level drug to get people into <laughs> using GIS. But it's important to me that I don't just have kids sitting on screens all the time. Even right now, as uh, it's remote teaching time, I'm still having my kids doing physical exercises to build their conceptual understanding of GIS. So there are a couple of activities I'm going to point you towards that help kids do this. The first one is going to be the Plato history of cartography. It's a favorite activity of kids in my classes every year. So here's a few pictures from my classroom. There are way more of these on my Twitter account at Mrs. Sinclair Maps. And again, all the links will be here for you. But here you can see that we're taking a screen time break and we are building our understanding of what is a base map, what are layers, what is good map design? How do contour lines work? That's kind of what's going on over here with the, um, the sticky notes on a paper map. Some of these things I have had to tweak for remote teaching, but a lot I have not. The Play-Doh activity in particular is one I'm going to show you because it's one you can do during remote learning. Here's what I mean. Woo, okay. So, Play-Doh, I'm going to actually, I'm going to try to mute the sound on this real quick. Hang on. Do, 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 do. And my controls are just in the way, so give me a second. I need to resize my screen so I can reach the controls. That did not help. All right, you're just going to have to hear me in the background, I think. Oh, no, I got it. Okay, so... Play-Doh is something that we all know there are recipes online to make some at home. You can make do with other types of clay. You can just get one of these, a dollar store brand um, to keep at home. And it's a really great way of modeling the concepts of how do we make sense of things that are actually 3D, but we're going to put them on a flat map. And how do we represent landforms on the very first layer of a map before we put other layers of information on top, which is something we, we also talk about in other lessons. What this student has done 
is he's made a mountain out of Play-Doh and then he's followed my directions, which I've typed up with the help of Esri, along with snapshots of every single step so that you can do it yourself, either with a kiddo at home, or you can give these directions to kids to follow over a Zoom class or in a club. And as he builds his mountain, we have a conversation about the history of cartography, how people have looked at landforms and represented them in different ways over time. Then he has this wonderful moment where he gets to destroy his mountain creation, cut it into layers, trace each layer one at a time, and build his own contour map, which builds a better understanding of how contour maps work than I could give him in any other way. So this is kind of a slow version of seeing how this works, but here's a little hyperlapse to kind of see what the end product is. Okay. And I just realized there's one link that I need to update for you here, but I did update it elsewhere. So the, here's the completed mountain, as you can see. The student has traced around the base of the mountain. Over here on her paper, she has stood above her Play-Doh mountain and looked straight down and sketched what she saw from a bird's eye view. She also got down at eye level with her desk and drew a profile of her mountain as she could see from straight across one angle. And now she's taking apart the mountain one step at a time and slicing it up at regular one centimeter intervals. And we talk about what that might be in real life. At the very end of this, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. At the very end of this, as she keeps deconstructing this one little centimeter at a time, check out what she ends up with. Here we go. She's done with all her Play-Doh. She goes from a profile to hasher marks to a contour map. And this is part of how we study how we map the Earth's surface. So if this is something that you're interested in, um, not the link that it has over here, fully typed instructions on teacher's pay, but actually I can do you one better because Esri helped me create a very detailed set of instructions for you. That includes what are all of the materials that kids need, and then breaks the activity up into little 15 minute and 30 minute increments if you uh, need to work on this over time. And also helps you look at how the Play-Doh helps kids understand the history of terrain mapping, the history of representing topography on a flat map. So here we see a satellite view. Here we see a view from ages ago that is more like this profile view. And you can click through each of these different examples to see the different types of mapping that the kids actually get to experience themselves. This is all here for you along with the step-by-step -step photos and of course example answers so that you as a teacher, as a geo mentor, as a, an adult leading the activity, you know what to say and lots of other links that can take you to expand the history lesson behind the Play-Doh. Okay, so the basic idea here is you don't just have to do screen activities to help kids understand GIS. We have taken the idea that you see here and built it into cardboard models. We've made fun wacky videos where we put on costumes and explain what is GIS and um, interview the adults in our lives to see what they know and then teach them something from what we've already learned. There are a million different ways that you can use your own teaching skills to build the concepts behind a GIS. So I'm almost done talking, but the next thing I want to show you is just what to do if you want to go to the next step. And that is, um, a great place to start is called the AGO 5x5. You may have heard of this. Um, I don't know too many people who have found it on their own, but it stands for ArcGIS Online, of course. And the 5x5 stands for five activities that each take five minutes or so to complete. 
These lead kids through a journey of self-discovery of just how a GIS works. So if you click on this link once you get it, once you get this slideshow in a moment, um, it's a simple PDF that requires, again, no sign-in, and again, has a link that you click on, and then directions that you follow. This one doesn't have questions with it. It's much more of an exploration activity for students. I like to use this after kids have used a geo inquiry so that they have a sense of, okay, I like this thing. We used it in one subject, but now I want to know how to really use more of the tools in the geo that were introduced in the geo inquiry. So you can see that there are instructions to learn how to just grab and hold and move the map, zoom in, zoom out. But by the time you get down here, you're learning how to use measurement tools. You're learning how to modify the map and add a symbol and change it. And then the kids just go crazy. They're like, ooh, I can change it into a star, into a pin, into whatever I want. And then kids get to start searching for their house, which if you've ever had kids on Google Earth, for example, you'll lose them for a half hour. So this is super fun. They also learn how to draw shapes on top of a map. So you'll have them drawing their favorite cartoon characters and whatever it is. Um, and then to actually play with other GIS apps that are out there so that they can explore what's possible with GIS. This is another great self-contained activity that can be done through remote teaching. I've been doing it this year. Um, and back in the spring, and is really easy for kids because they are those digital natives that just click around and figure things out. And I've used this with 10 year olds up to 14 year olds and they don't need my help. They just click around and figure out how to do every single thing on the list. Okay, so finally, I want you to take all this information and either if you are a teacher who wants to try this, find a geo mentor who would be willing to be that person to hold your hand and give you the confidence it takes to just try this one time in your classroom and see if you don't love it. If you are not a teacher, you should be that person. You can go from zero GIS experience and be a geo mentor to if you're a hero in GIS and you know all the things, but you weren't sure what to do with kids, you can use the activities I've just shown you to be a geo mentor to a classroom or a club or a group of kids who would love to learn how to use the powerful tools within GIS. Once you get the slideshow, you will be able to click on this link, find some children and give them maps. And that will make me very happy if you do that. So I would love to open up to questions. I'd be happy to share more projects and things that I do with students, but I really think that these are some of the best starting points that anyone can use in any setting with students. I am going to um, put the link now to this slideshow in the chat. Give me a second to make the screen ugly though, because first I've got to do the lovely little share link situation. And then Charlie, I don't know if you are the person who wants to like moderate questions in any way. If this is my Zoom classroom children, I would just use my own rules for that and I can. Charlie, tell me what you want. Uh, you can go ahead if you like. I and, is they're listening and, to me. I could be wrong. And so you think that so far Sorry, people are just saying. Done. Putting cool. it in the chat. <laughs> chat. Thank you, Karen Rogers, saying this is super cool. I'm glad. I hope if it helps anybody out there, I will be happy. Here's the presentation in the chat. Okay, I'll go back to the pretty slide. Do -do -do. Questions! And then I'll actually go here so that if you want to be looking at other things um, that I've done, Twitter is the best, best place at Mrs. Sinclair Maps. Okay. Thanks, Laura. And that was great. We do have this some is... participants. Show me where you're at. Um, since I'm not hearing from Charlie, I will just say if you want to do the blue raise your hand icon in the chat, or sorry, in your, the participants list, then I can see you there and call on you. The other thing that we can do is if you want to just type a question into the chat, I can read that out loud looking through to see if we have anything.
I can also just keep talking if I need to. Right. Brett says, I'm absolutely going to use these resources. Thank you. Great. Please do. That makes me so happy. Even yeah, if you do it one time, it's going to have that ripple effect and other people will start using it. I've now gone from, you know, I can only reach 180 kids a school year with what I teach, but now I've got about five, six other teachers at my school that they each have a reach of 180 kids and they do this now too. And so do the multiplication. That's fantastic. And that also means that kids are getting more than one um, experience with a GIS like this and they love it. They're so engaged. Um, they're so excited about it. Lauren, this is Stacy. Can you hear me? I can now. Thank you, okay. Charlie. Um, I was wondering if a teacher wanted to start using ArcGIS Online outside of, well, you, you mentioned a few things about how to extend a geo inquiry, but I'm wondering how you would suggest they start with that. Um, Absolutely, that's a great question. So I have created my own curriculum that starts from, I do for my technology courses, I start with some of these hands-on activities. I start with the AGO 5x5, and then I've created my own progression that leads kids through units that essentially go from what is GIS? We do a lot of what I just showed you, the Play-Doh activity, um, the cardboard activity, a couple of different creative artistic notes, AGO 5x5, some geo inquiries. And then we go into how do you design your own map? That builds off of the school, the skills in the AGO 5x5. And I have kids do activities using um, ArcGIS Online with signed in accounts. So that's just the next step of complication. I would love to talk to any teacher who is interested in going that next step. Um, my email address is on the screen right now because that's something that I think you really have to um, specialize for the age group that you have and for the amount of time you have. I have one class that lasts one semester that is sixth graders. I teach them completely differently than I teach my eighth grade class that lasts one semester. My eighth grade kids are doing stuff around gerrymandering and elections and then creating story maps on their own research projects. My sixth graders are creating meme maps of our school campus or their neighborhood. So it's just, it's a different approach each time but I'd be happy to help people with that. I have a question from Charlie. He says, Lauren, have you or um, other teachers used geo inquiries in remote operation? Any differences in operation or value? That's a great question. Yes, we have been using them. Differences in value? No. Differences in operation? Not really. I mean, that's the great thing about geo inquiries is it really is just about how well do kids read. So if they can read, <laughs> then they can succeed. Um, I found maybe one or two places that based on my particular students, I needed to clarify some wording. So for example, in a recent eighth grade geo inquiry, there were students who were confused about a question that was comparing two different layers of an old district shape and size to a new one. So I just clarified the wording and then they were great. But that's pretty much all that ever comes up. I really like to turn my geo inquiries into Google Forms when I can because that makes the grading so quick and easy. I also like to add on to the end of a geo inquiry, a step for action. So my eighth grade class just completed a geo inquiry about gerrymandering. And at the end, I asked them to research a gerrymandering ballot initiative here in Oregon, and then create a social media post about it so that they had an action to take that would actually make a difference. They loved this part of the project and it gave added value to the questions they were answering along the way in the geo in inquiry because they used that information for their final social media post. I've had other teachers as well that are new to geo inquiries in the past two or three years. They've been using them too and they asked the same question, hey, can I do this remotely? And I'm like, yes, I will help you if you need it. And they said it went off without a hitch.
So I have another question from Charlie. Have you had students use a geo inquiry to build a map viewer presentation? I have not. I have been focusing in the past couple of years more on story maps for my eighth graders in particular. So they've been building story maps that I can pull up real quick that are based on a video series that I will actually, hello, come on. There we go, escape. Um, do, do, do. The, the geo, in, sorry, not geo inquiry, the Learn ArcGIS team at Esri is partnering with me to make a video series for older middle school to high school students about how to map disease. And we've finished filming, we're in production, we should have that to you guys soon. But that is where my students made this as I was testing things out on them, which is storyboard, uh, story maps about, hang on just a second, about uh, mapping disease. This is a GIS one, but I'm not going to hang out here because it includes student faces, sadly. There are wonderful memes on here though. I wish I could show you that they created about what is GIS. So mapping disease. These are some story maps that students made after about a two month study of how we learn from and map epidemics. So these are all different students of mine that created these story maps. And if we click on one, we can see that they included everything that they learned, hang on, from a geo inquiry about mapping the Black Plague. That was a first step. And then they followed a Learn ArcGIS lesson with a sign in to learn how to map cholera. And then they created their own story map to share everything that they had learned and some steps for action that people can take in this pandemic and in future pandemics. Sorry, my internet is so slow. This is a map that a student made and all of the text on the side is stuff that she typed. Um, she found all of these images, told her story, and then ended with a call to action by participating in the missing maps mapathon. So that's just one example there. Okay, coming back to the chat. So Stacy has a question. Do your students do units that result in a map product that is part of the grade? Yes. If so, how do they share them? And Charlie beat me to it. Okay, so same kind of thing. So this is exactly how I do it. Along the way, I have formative exercises that I'm trying to think if I can pull this up really quickly. I think I can do this safely without showing student faces. So along the way, I have little activities like choice boards um, where kids get to choose to do GIS activities and then upload screenshots and say, hey, here's the activity I did and I get a cool badge for doing that, just something I made to give them an incentive. Um, they can watch videos that give them information about what is GIS or what is this thing we're trying to map. And then they, they can also <laughs> create memes like this one. We have a situation. The geographic information system is not allowing babies to use maps. That's, that's the sixth graders interpretation. Um, they use these different activities along the way to just be more formative learning experiences where I can check like, yes, you've done this activity, you're learning more, but then the final product, product as Stacy is asking, is usually a map that they work on for at least a month after they've done all these little activities to show me that they're learning the little bits along the way. And that's where they get their final score, like you saw on the um, story maps of mapping disease. These were actually scores uh, down in the comments down here. I said level eight, I'm captivated, blah, blah, blah. So. Okay, 
The choice boards are really fun. So that's something that I didn't have time to talk about today, but I could definitely put a link in the presentation. It's a little bit more involved, but essentially it's a tic-tac-toe grid where kids have choices of watch a video about GIS, actually play with a GIS, do an activity, um, go interview someone about GIS, go do some artwork related to GIS, different learning styles so that they can fit their own um, learning preference. Those are really fun and get kids away from screens for part of the time, which is important to me, excuse me. <coughs> any other questions? I'm gonna go back to the participants window and see if there are any of those raised hands now that I can hear people. Lauren, this is Stacy. Um, I'm wondering, so one thing that we've found that teachers resist about geo inquiries is they're not always relatable because the the uh, geographic location is not something the kids are familiar with and so um, we've done a we've done a few in Minnesota to make them they're they're still geo inquiries but they're Minnesota data specific and I'm just wondering um, if you've done with your geo inquiries if you found that sometimes you you're helping teachers get local data or how you would go about doing that? Like, do you, um, do you use the same geo inquiry and then just swap out some different data or would you, um, do you have enough comfort level now to write your own geo inquiries with local data or how do you do that? That's a great question. So that's something that I really only do in my eighth grade GIS class. Um, in my sixth grade class, the kids create a map of their own campus, but they do that using like the collector app and the survey one, two, three app. So they create their own later layers of data and they just build those on a base map. We don't really go looking for other data sets for that particular age group. For my eighth graders in particular, um, I allow them to choose their own topic and it's worldwide. Some of them choose things that are located in Portland. Some of them choose research questions that take them to more of a national scale or a global scale. And then I've basically developed a system of remotely, like digitally, giving them little links from learnarcgis.com um, that help them with a certain skill. And then I put the onus on them to tweak that. So for example, I had an eighth grade group that really wanted to create a map of tsunami, um, a history of tsunami activity. I didn't have a particular lesson set up to help them do that. So I gave them first a link to an existing Learn ArcGIS lesson about how to map hurricane data over time. I asked them to complete that first and prove to me that they had done it. And then I said, now I will help you by giving you some tsunami data. Let's explore how to research this problem together. So they found some basic websites with tsunami data. Then I coached them through a screen share. How do you look for the right thing? Like a table of values that we can turn into a CSV. Then I said, okay, now that we have this, you've already done a Learn ArcGIS lesson that says how to take that spreadsheet, turn it into a CSV and add it to your map. This is your responsibility. I will not help you until you've tried it twice. So they try it out. They might hit a hang up, but they have the best sense of satisfaction when they do it successfully. And then once they have it on there, then they're ready for the question of, okay, now what do we do with this data that's on our map? So then we start talking about the range of data they want to include, how they want to symbolize it. So that's kind of the flow that we've used for issues from Portland, Oregon to a global scale is starting with a generalized skill set and then saying, if this is what you want to do at the local level, prove to me that you can do it in this context first. Practice. That is very helpful. Thank you. That's, that's great. Absolutely. And again, if anyone is at that point and would like to see more details, like the Google Docs I use to organize this, see an example, please email me. I would love to help you with that. 
Any other questions? I know we're getting towards the end of our time, but thank you so much for giving me your time and, and letting me talk so much about something I'm really excited about. And I will definitely put links to ArcGIS, or excuse me, Learn ArcGIS and the choice board on my presentation that you already have access to. Please make sure that if you wanted that link, you copy it now because as you know, these chats kind of disappear after a Zoom session and it can be difficult to find again. I'll put my contact info up one more time in case you need it. That is here. Oh, very kind, Karen. Thank you so much. I'm trying to reach as many people as possible, and I'm grateful for any opportunity. I have to talk with teachers from small groups to large groups. So if any of you feel like this message needs to go to a different audience, please let me know. I'm happy to share. Lauren, we'll share this video with you too, of course. So if you Great. want to um, share your recorded version with others, please. Wonderful. And I'll put it on my Twitter as well so that anybody here, well, I know you're going to receive it other ways, but you can share it easily that way. I will say that if you are not on Twitter, I know this seems weird, but I had some folks that um, I had met through the Esri Users Conference, which I highly recommend to anyone who really wants to take their uh, K-12 teaching to the next level with GIS. Um, they told me that apparently GIS people are on Twitter something I did not know as a teacher. I did not know that was a thing. So I got on there and I'm connected to some really great educators there who give me new ideas every day. So I'm finding new activities constantly, uh, retweeting those so that you can see them if you follow me. It's really great. And I will, yes, add my Twitter info in this spreadsheet, Sarah. Thank you. Oh, and there it goes. I will definitely do that. Lauren, have you ever had some, I'm just asking because no one else is asking a question, so <laughs> please, I don't, I don't want to dominate, but I'm wondering, have you ever had uh, to um, advocate for some of the, the lessons that you do if they're not exactly in the regular curriculum to your administrators to, to show them that GIS was a useful way to teach? Thank you for bringing that up because I do want to encourage everyone out there listening. Uh, my school is not super supportive of what I do. My school doesn't have good computers. We use tiny Chromebooks with screens like this. And yet I have been super successful and the teachers and the students are so into it. So it doesn't take all of that to make this happen. You, you really can just do it with one teacher being interested in one classroom. Um, I will say that as far as spreading the word, I have basically found that the best way to do it in my school is not, I, I wasn't able to get my administrator on board yet, I'm still trying all the time, but I have been able to get other teachers to try it. And when I volunteer my time once to go into their classroom and say, hey, you sit back there and drink your coffee and just watch me do this and watch that it doesn't take anything special that has been the thing that has converted other teachers to give it a try. And the kids love it and beg for more. And the teacher's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this every year at this time now. And then it just kind of starts growing. And now my administrator at least is like, oh yeah, this is a thing that Lauren does and a bunch of teachers are into it. Okay, fine. And I, this is Charlie, I can vouch for that. I went and visited Lauren's class back in February in the before time and uh, it was really interesting as she took over a class that was another teacher's class and taught a geo inquiry and had fun and the kids enjoyed it and the teacher actually liked it. And so this is actually a really useful way if you're trying to spread GIS into some other classes, particularly for classes that are ones that might feed into yours uh, to build the capacity of the students that you're going to inherit. It's a, it's a smart strategy to do that. History and geography classes have usually been the first takers 
as I offer this to teachers, it's a natural fit. Um, so social studies, essentially. So I've really targeted the social studies teachers at my school, and those are the ones who have been the most open to giving this a try, and they're the ones who have stuck it with it for years now. They're the ones that every year when a certain time comes around in their curriculum, they say, okay, we're studying, um, we're studying Egypt, do you have that thing ready for me? We're studying the cradles of civilization, do you have that geo-inquiry ready for me? I'm like, yep. So that, that's an easy sell, an easy connection point. There are great connections to other subjects as well. I just, that's where I've had the most success. And I will just say, if there's anyone out there who is a, a technology teacher like me, this can become your whole curriculum. When I was offered a technology class at my school, I said, oh, I can turn it into a GIS class. And that's what it is. I've also turned classes labeled design into GIS classes because I call it map design, GIS design. And we go through the design process, but using GIS as our tool. So there's a lot of ways that you can think of different classes as GIS. I have an environmental science class that has become a field studies and GIS class because that's one way of becoming a scientist. So there, there are lots of ways that you can make it work within your existing structure. Great, thanks. We heard a couple of good examples about um, science projects at noon today um, with using Survey123 and collecting data. Yeah, and you know, if that's your end goal, but maybe you have a science team that feels like that's super ambitious for them, this is the gateway drug. Again, just do one little geo inquiry about science where it's very, it's understandable. It's like, oh, okay, I can do this. Now I will say, if you're letting the kids direct their own learning, where you're at the front of the class saying, okay, kids, here's the question. Now I want you to discover on your own screen and you've got 30 laptops out, a geo inquiry is not gonna take you 15 minutes like it says on the PDF. It's gonna take you an hour, great. Awesome. And you can split it into two classes if you want. If you don't have that much time, you can just put it up on the projector and you be the clicker and ask the questions and then click on things and move the timing along. So you can really fit it into whatever amount of time you have. Speaking of timing. Yes, I think that is a wrap. Um, we have another session just at three o'clock here, which is kind of our uh, just wrap up and a few more resources to share out. Um, and yeah, you're welcome to stay, Lauren. I'm going to switch the slide, I guess, if that's all right. Please do. Yep. And unfortunately, I do have more classes I have to teach today. I have a weird schedule, but I'm really excited for what you guys are doing today and wish I could stay. Thanks so much for sharing uh, your, <laughs> thanks so much for sharing with us today, Lauren. That's really um, inspiring and you've done some great work. I'm looking forward to following you some more. Absolutely. Thanks to everybody. It looks like there's still some folks in the other room, so we need them to come over here before we start. Hey, Stacy, can you um, make me a, what do you call it, a um, co-host? So